How many of you have seen Motorcycle Diaries? Oh, I love that movie. <laughs> this is a bit of a boy story, I suppose. Um, a couple of years ago, I saw the movie and I went to South Africa, not South America, where I'd never been before and rented a large motorbike for the Ewan McGregor's Drug Around the World, which I call Spike. Because motorbikes are female things, and Spike was quite masculine. <laughs> personal trainer of my friend in Key West <laughs> <laughs> and did the motorcycle diaries trick on us and I sent some emails home and this was the third email at the end of the trip. Hola amigos, I'm back in Buenos Aires after 5,500 kilometers in 10 days on the South American road. Journey's end is mixed emotions, a combination of exhilaration at the enormousness of where the faithful an ever-reliable spike has taken me. Relief that Allah has brought me back safe after the challenges of the RG Road, because few moments in the past two weeks have passed when I've not been conscious of the hair's breadth of a wandering cow or a careless truck driver that separates an RG bike rider from quadriplegia. Melancholy that that's history now and not something to look forward to anymore, and that heavy feeling that it's time to get back to being a grown-up. <laughs> The days, I'll say, the days since leaving Valparaiso to its annual New Year's Eve student massacre had been extraordinary. Spike took me across the Andes over the 11,000-foot Portillo Pass, a bare cliff place of heart-stopping wildness and grandeur, where the screaming wind all but lifts your bike into the void and vegetation is a stranger. Mountains a million years older than the arid East Alps. A night in Mendoza, the RG wine capital, a city as elegant as a 1950s Alfa Romeo ad. And then on to Los Potreros, a place of pilgrimage for numerous horse-mad friends, where the Begg family, anglo argies of four generations, inhabited a stantia half the size of Wales, 30 miles north of Cordoba. Thanks to Astrid Harrison, the previous email note, who was working this stantia, I had been squeezed in for the 30th and 31st of December. The begs take in paying punters, put them on horses, and take them riding. As I don't do horses, I've gone for a two-hour walk, <laughs> half walk, half jog, into the rolling hills. Owls perch on fences. These owls hunt in daytime. They sleep at night in deep burrows dug by the local chinchilla. Chinchilla leave the burrows to hunt at night, perfect harmony. <laughs> then I find myself in the middle of a field bigger than Norfolk and looking around realized there were 200 shiny black bulls and cows. Many protecting their calves, stationed at 20 yard intervals throughout the field, each one half a ton of muscled marble sirloin, all motionless, and everyone looking directly at me as if I had just bounced a check on it. I looked for a hiding place in case one of these giant black beasts chose to get sirloin's revenge and charge. <laughs> Hiding behind a clump of grass, the only vegetation in the field did not seem a, a bull-fooling option. So I walked purposely on, taking care to avoid the accusatory eyes and was thankfully ignored. Before dinner, and I do not use the word dinner lightly on New Year's Eve, at 7 p.m., as the shadows lengthened, we walked half a mile from the house to stand on a hillside, while a lone gaucho, all in black, but for a crimson faja, F-A-J-A, pronounced Faka Kamaban, <laughs> stampeded a 40-strong group of wild horses past us. My only problem was that I fell in love with the wonderful Astrid. She's a 28-year-old photographer who's flapping around South America <laughs> doing things to horses. Don't ask me why, because I find horses frightening creatures. <laughs> Unfortunately, a rigorous application of Miles' tenth law, a chap can't chase a woman who is younger than the square root of his age and multiplied by four. <laughs> in my case, comes to 36, unfortunately. <laughs> made me realize that Astrid will remain a mirage for me, and I will reluctantly have to introduce her to my undeserving nephew, James, to keep her in the family. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, but, well, despite all this square root stuff, Astrid and I got a cab at 1.30 a.m. on New Year's Eve after the punters had gone to bed to take us to Rio Savajos, the local town, half an hour down a corrugated mud track. Astrid's charm got us past the tight door policy at Petaki, the bougie of Rio Savajos, and we found ourselves 
two amongst a thousand heaving, seething, argy, New York party people. A nicer group of good-looking revelers you will never meet. 28-year-old Astrid is probably 10 years older than the next oldest person there. But despite this, I seem to remember she and I holding numerous important conversations in languages I don't immediately recall <laughs> with fellow party goers, chiefly about philosophy. <laughs> Not quite sure what happened after our first couple of drinks as navigation became a problem. But all of a sudden, it was 7 a.m., and Astrid and I were in a taxi bouncing our way back to Los Patreras as the RG sun rose over the wild hills. All new years should be like this, not a whisper of dreaded old lang sign. And now back in Buenos Aires, the circle closed. <clears throat> Sorry not to be in biker gear tomorrow. Non-bikies don't realize how physical biking is, quite unlike driving a car. Steering a bike, of course, is done with the weight, as in skiing, not by turning the wheels and driving a car. You slow for a corner, pick the best line, being careful not to trespass over the midline for a left-hand bend, for a midline for a left-hand bend is you do not want to be decapitated as you lean into bend by an oncoming bus. Throw your inside knee out to lead you into the turn and bank the bike, the sharper the turn, the steeper the bank. And then as you go into the turn, and just as the weight of the bike, of the slowing bike is coming close to making it fall, you wind the throttle to pour on power, and the bike starts to move back to the vertical as a centrifugal force, but the added power pushes it upright and back towards the outside of the bend. And as soon as you come out of the bend, out goes the other lead, and you're picking your line for the next corner. The bike rising and falling for corner after corner, much like a Salon skier throwing her weight from left to right as she flips through the poles. After a few minutes of a long swooping run through the Andes, or the Sierra Chica, the adrenaline is pumping so hard you're gasping. The rhythm of high mountain road turns makes you feel you're flirting with heaven as you throw half a ton of screaming machine into bend after bend. Part of the intoxication comes from the knowledge that if you pick the wrong line going into bend because you've underestimated its sharpness, you do not have the option of braking halfway round as you put in a car. As hitting the brakes would throw the bike upright and force you straight ahead and off the cliff. All you can do if a corner unexpectedly tightens into itself is to force the bike even further over onto its ear and pray it too will tighten into the turn. And then there are the times floating at cruising speed of 5,000 revs, about 90 miles an hour, across the limitless pampas, Chuck Berry may be leaning away on the iPod and just <laughs> making himself heard over the thrum of 5,000 BMW opposed twin revs. A blue sky, bigger than any you've ever seen, empty but for hawks and eagles. And the Andes smudge on the horizon. What a country. Where else has such generosity, grandeur, and largeness of spirit? <clears throat> Despite no more Spanish than hola, ciao, and gracias, it's impossible to be here and not have endless friendly greetings with people, whether they're buying you a rum in the disco or stroking Spike's thigh and saying, quel moto. <laughs> <laughs> and when I have somehow explained that Spike and I travel in the tire treads of Che, I get a squeeze on the arm, a clap on the back, a small appreciation, and the Ahe Condias. Cha cha. Yay! Yay.